Hi, everybody. My name is Jonathan Jones. I am a physical education teacher in Bowie, Maryland, which is right outside of Washington, DC. I'm also the moderator for this session and a member of the, the, um, the Phys Edagogy team. Welcome to Phys Ed Summer 3.0. Thank you so much for joining us for this 24 hour back to back global event. We cannot make this day happen without you. We are very humbled by the outpouring of support and promotion of the summit from each and every one of you. By sharing with just one person, you're able to impact hundreds of students. Thank you so much for being here to push best practices, effective physical education, and professional development forward. This is a truly amazing PE community that we are so fortunate to be a part of. Just a reminder that since we're using technology, things happen. So if, it, so if for any reason the video feed stops, please check out the Tazel for the new video link. It may take us a few minutes to get it started rolling again. We thank you for your patience. Also, um, Tazel will also be used for any conversation you want to have about this session. So if you want to ask, ask the presenter any, any type of questions at all, just post it in Tazel and I will ask David the question at the end of his session. After the summit, we will post the feedback survey to the Visit Summit 3.0 homepage. We hope that you will provide us with some feedback so that we can make 4.0 even better. In order to receive your PD certificate, you will need to fill out a quick survey after the summit. So we will post that survey probably tomorrow, and then you'll be able to find it on our website, on Twitter, and also we'll be sending a notice through email if you RSVP. So without further ado, I'm gonna kick it to Mr. David Tran. He will go ahead and introduce himself. Hi everyone, uh, my name's David. Um, and I'm a physical education teacher. I've been teaching as a PE teacher now for going on eight years. Uh, I've taught every level. I've taught pre-K all the way up through college. And currently, I'm a high school physical education teacher at a charter school located here in the greater LA area. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. And I'll talk a little bit about me a little bit more once uh, I get this this uh, slide going on, so let's jump right in. So we're going to be talking about um, teaching combatives and blended learning in physical education. And some people have asked me already what's combatives, or they're not quite sure what combatives is. And so real quick, combatives is, in essence, just a fighting system. Um, and so a lot of people are kind of hesitant about it. You know, Maybe your experience isn't so uh, involved or uh, great in, in martial arts or anything like that. So uh, I'm here to show you how we can use blended learning and flipped instruction to uh, make that session a little bit better for you and so you don't feel so nervous about what's going on. So like I said, a little bit about me. I'm a blended learning coach. I became a blended learning coach earlier this year. And uh, though I got the title earlier this year, I've uh, started the previous uh, school year, at the beginning of the school year. Um, I'd actually never heard of blended learning up until about two summers ago. And when I heard about it, I was very fascinated by the idea of using technology in the classroom, but not just for the sake of using technology. Um, additionally, I've, I've been a lecturer at Cal State LA since 2004. Like I said, a PE teacher since 2007, and I've been teaching martial arts since '96. But don't don't think that just because I've been teaching martial arts that long, that's why I'm able to do this. It's, it has no bearing on that at all. Um, so, what is blended learning? It's not the same as technology-rich instruction. Like I said, it's not bringing in and using laptops and iPads and things like that in the classroom. It, it goes beyond that. It goes beyond even the one-to-one -one computers and, and high-tech gadgets that you'll use uh, in class. It's, it's about um, involving and leveraging the internet and technology so that you can create a more personalized learning environment for those students. And it's allowing the students, giving up control, yes, I know we're teachers, but we have to give up that control, uh, and giving up that control to the students so that they can choose when they want to learn, where they want to learn, how they want to learn, 
um, and if they want to continue learning uh, whatever it is that we're teaching them. So making sure that we do those things and allowing them to do that. Um, flipped instruction, on the other hand, is taking the direct instruction out of your class and um, instead of trying to teach direct instruction to the entire group, um, you allow the students to actually do get the direct instruction from you or some other source, again, using technology to leverage that, and allowing them to do it in their own personal space in their own way. So if they want to learn, watch the video, or read about something on their phone, their iPads, their whatever devices that they want to use, let, allowing them that flexibility to be able to do that. Um, and then what do we do in the classroom then? It's actually taking that, that class time and allowing the students to interact with you and allows you to be able to guide the students and let them apply concepts and let them fail because that's an important part, letting them fail and, and letting them experience what it's like but under your watchful eye. So um, I, the way I see it is I take what you normally do in the classroom and I turn that into the homework and I take what I normally want to do for homework and I put that inside the classroom. That's probably one of the greatest or best ways to describe that. So combatives, like I said, is a term for hand-to-hand -hand combat training and techniques. So it includes things like martial arts, um, MMA, uh, for those of you that don't know, mixed martial arts, uh, any type of boxing, fencing, wrestling, all that. Um, it also includes uh, self-defense, so you can totally, and most schools teach self-defense as their combatives unit. So before I get going, I want to prep our brain. Some of you might have been seeing uh, a lot of presentations today, so you might be just joining in, or maybe you just woke up. I don't know where you are in the world, right? But I want to throw in a little brain break right now. So we're going to do a workout from Insanity. Um, it's called the high low jab squats. So what are you going to do is you're going to get up. Um, I hope the sound is playing, but if the sound's not playing, just follow along with the lady on there. Uh, and what you're going to do is simply do a squat and jab low and then jump up and squat in the high position. So here we go. It's only about a minute long, folks. Oh, that didn't work. Why did that not work? Let's try that again. All right, here we go. There you go. Get it. Okay. Squat down, punch low. Squat, jump up, punch high. So you're punching down low, jumping up, punching high. It's going down low, jumping up, going high. Down low, up high. We're almost done. About halfway. I'll leave the tracker up for those of us that want to see how much we got. Switch sides. Make sure you're doing the other side now. Punch down, punch up. Punch down, punch up. Almost done. We got about 10 seconds left. There you go. You got it. You got it. Almost, almost, and there you go. We are done. Thank you for participating in today's Brain Break. All right. Whoops, I'm sorry. If, uh, Justin, you're watching, I meant Brain Boost, not Brain Break. Just want to throw that out there because uh, please don't kill me on Twitter and Boxer later. <laughs> All right, so, so let's get it. So the first thing that I always start with uh, with my class is I give them a uh, personal best assessment. And I took this from uh, Spark. They have a lot of personal best assessments at the beginning of every, uh, every single one of their units. And so I decided to take that same format and offer the students a way to pre-assess what they know already. And it gives me a better idea of where I should focus my efforts. So as you can see, this is what I did last year. I did uh, five different uh, combative systems. So I did Krav Maga, Boxing, Judo, Capoeira, and Tai Chi. Of those five, I've only, let's see, done Krav Maga. I did a little bit of Krav Maga when I was in college. Um, boxing, I've never done in my life. Judo, I am a brown belt in Judo. Capoeira, I've only ever taken one class in my entire life. And Tai Chi, uh, I took maybe five classes of Tai Chi. So in terms of my experience, uh, Judo it, and Krav Maga is probably the one that I spent the most doing. Judo I've been doing for years. 
whereas Prabhu Magai did it for an entire uh, quarter at Cal State LA. So, what you want to do is you just to zoom in so you can see this a little bit better. So, uh, what I have is I have a four point system. I want to know how much skill do you think you have? Have you heard of it or never tried? Heard of it? Uh, never tried it? You've heard of it? You've seen it, but you don't. You haven't tried it before. Three would be you've done it before and and you have some idea of what we're going to be doing. And then four, you know, you've got some skills. You're not an expert, but you know maybe you've taken classes before and so on and so forth. So after I get this, I have the students do this digitally for me. Um, we are a gay school. And so the students sign in, and they each get their own form, and they rank what they, where they are on their document, and they go over to the goal where they want to be at the end. And it's OK if they don't put a four at the end. Um, not every student is going to love every single one of the systems that you decide to introduce to them. I can tell you right now, Tai Chi is usually not the one that anybody wants to do. It's very slow, and it's very, uh, for them, boring. It's not fast-paced enough. So when you're deciding to do this, you want to start with the end in mind. You want to find the standard that you're teaching. You want to break that standard down. Um, so what would proficiency look like? What uh, what's it going to sound like? Um, figure out what assessments you're going to use. If uh, they're pre-made, if you're going to create your own, so on and so forth. And what the what lessons are you actually going to create so that your assessments are actually assessing what you want. So you're actually teaching what you want to assess. And in ultimately, you're assessing what you actually want them to be able to do, which is the standard. Right? And so I'm going to take you to my Google Doc. Hopefully it opens up. This is actually the lesson plan that I actually used. And I put the link in Tozzle, so those of you that can't see it on the screen, you can go to Tozzle um, and look at it. This is the actual lesson plan that I actually used for this particular lesson that I taught. Uh, I was telling Jonathan a little bit earlier that um, I actually did this lesson for my teacher observation this past year. Um, and you'll see some of the comments that my uh, principal has put up on there if you take a look at it. But I started with my content standard. And then after my content standard, I broke down using Webb's uh, depths of knowledge what it was that I actually wanted the students to be able to do so that they would actually meet that standard. So recall the names and how to perform various movement patterns, demonstrating uh, movement patterns relating to body movements, such as kicks and escapes, combining and applying simple movement patterns uh, uh, independently or with a partner, combine and applying simple movement patterns uh, to complex patterns independently with a partner, and then uh, being able to actually perform all of these particular things in a hora. And a hora is, in, in capoeira, um, is the circle that you play in. Right? And so then I came up with criteria for competence. This is, again, part of the whole breaking down the standard part of your work. And this is really intense. This lesson plan is 14 pages long. This is not a lesson plan that you're going to be doing all the time, every day. This is just, however, one that I use to break it down. Because I'm not familiar with capoeira, I really needed to break all the skills down. And I watched a lot of videos, and I went to a lot of websites. I read a lot of books. I even contacted uh, people who did capoeira so that I could figure out exactly what was easy and easy to teach at the beginning level versus something that I saw. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, well, I can do that, so my students should be able to do that. So breaking, breaking all those skills down. Um, here are the actual skills that we were going to do. And if you actually click on them, the links are live. So you can actually go to see a video on how to actually perform the skill. And I put skills, I broke them up. Because the standards are calling for simple and, and complex movement patterns, I, I moved all the basic skills, the simple ones, to one area. And I put the more complex skills in another area. right? And then, I, of course, this is a California thing. We uh, we have um, descriptions of the quality of what it should look like in terms of uh, competency. So at level one, they're simply able to apply and combine some random movement patterns uh, in capoeira, and they attempt to perform the jinga, right? And so whereas a level six competency is they're combining and applying all the complex, all the simple, uh, in an actual game itself. So the games are not pre preset movement patterns, it's it's live, you have to, on your feet, on your toes, moving around. Um, now, 
how is this, how do I flip it? So by flipping what I do in, I've created a document for the students. Again, it has the standards. This was uh, what I used for my entire unit in Capoeira. This was a document that they constantly went back to. Um, I started out with a do now. None of them, or very few of them, had ever heard of Capoeira before. So in the video, I showed a video of what Capoeira looks like. And it was a very high quality uh, Capoeira players and whatnot. And so they would click on it. They'd be taken to the video. You can link YouTube videos. Our school, we were having problems with YouTube. So I actually took the videos off of YouTube um, and then embedded it in my Google Drive itself. So then the students would watch the video. And I'll play the video a little bit, but I'll turn off the sound. So you can see if you've never seen what capoeira looks like. Uh, capoeira is very athletic. It involves a lot of twisting, kicking, jumping, uh, spinning, and things like that. And so uh, it's it can be very um, challenging to the kids. And so I wanted to show them that this is high level. This is like people who've been training for years. And if they continue, then they wanted to continue, they could be able to do these techniques. And you can see here they're going real slow. This is some of the things that the kid, my own students, were doing in class. right? So after they watched that video, they would then go back to our wonderful lesson document. And I then had them go over a brief history um, of the move, or of capoeira and where it came from. You can see they had the basic movements. Uh, I broke it down for them. I broke down the description. I also use, um, in capoeira, they use Portuguese for all their terms. And so I use uh, the Portuguese term as well and phonetically spelled out the terms for them so they knew exactly what I was saying. So I actually had to learn the terms so I knew how to call the moves. I, could, I didn't want to be in the class, for example, saying uh, the cartwheel, do the cartwheel, when if they were to ever go outside of my class and actually go and train in capoeira, it would not be called a cartwheel, it would be called an awu. And so making sure that the students knew that, so teaching them there. Uh, let's see, what else? Every single uh, move is linked to a video. I also have the videos placed in folders so that the students can actually just go into the folders and look at the particular technique. Um, what I do in the lesson to, again, do more of the blended learning is I stand out uh, on the side. I tell the students, this is your information. Go. I, I do give them on my whiteboard. I'll write, like, this is the things that, these are the things I'm expecting you to understand by the end of the day. So on the very first day we did a particular, uh, this particular unit, it was make sure you know how to do the Jenga and make sure you know how to, at the very least, how a, an awu or a, a cartwheel is done. You didn't have to be perfect at it. I also showed them the real simple versions of cartwheel, so I would break down the, the full cartwheel down to a simpler version. Because um, in capoeira, a cartwheel is any time your legs go over your head. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to do a full gymnastics cartwheel. And then I would let them play. I would turn on some capoeira music. I'd play the capoeira music on the side. I'd go around, and I'm constantly checking in with all the students. Um, I used clickers. I'd open it up and basically tell the kids, all right, grab your clicker cards. And they all had their cards already. How many of you uh, can do the jenga? And on a one, two, three, four with the clickers, I was able to have them say, OK, four, you're an expert at it, and you're able to help people. A three, you got it down, but you're not quite sure how to teach someone else how to do it yet. A two is you're struggling, you need some help. A one, you had no idea what was going on. And then in the middle of class, I would regroup my students. So it'd be taking all the fours and putting them together with the ones. And so the fours would help out the ones with the technique. I would go around, and I'd check in on the twos and so on and so forth, so that then they're constantly moving around my room without me saying anything, and they're just already helping each other out. Because I find uh, the students usually will figure out another way of doing the technique or explaining the technique that the other students will understand better than whatever I'm saying. Um, as a teacher, I tend to use high, academ high ac academic language when I'm teaching my class, because I feel it's important for them to understand academic terms. but Sometimes the students just need to hear, all you have to do is put your feet up over this or put your hand on the ground instead of saying something more complex. No.
um, rotate this and that, and the kids will just say spin. So that's that. Oh, no, sorry. Go back. That's too soon. So at the end of each lesson, I have an exit ticket for the kids. Again, this is another piece of the blended learning. Um, they have to put their name, put in their period, and then I ask them two questions. Explain which movement was easiest for you to perform today, and then have them explain why, and then explain which one was most difficult, um, and tell me why. Uh, the reason why I ask these questions, it allows me to then, on the following day when I see them, I can then take the students who are struggling with a particular technique and again, group them with students who understood how to do the technique a little bit better. Uh, ultimately, it's making sure that I'm able to check in with the students on a one-on-one, -on -one, even though I'm not able to physically go and check in with every single student one-on-one, -on -one, because there's only so much time in a class. Um, another way that you can set all this stuff up, I created a long time ago for uh, some teachers in my district on how they can do something similar to what I've done and I created uh, basically this is a Google form and it takes you through all the steps on how to create another uh, like an independent learning station for the kids so if you really want to take that one single sheet that I talked about earlier this sheet right here and you want to expand and make it so that it's more in-depth you can put it embed things in the Google form make it part of the slide and that way they would be able to go and embed a video, ask a question, then you can have them move on. If they don't understand the skill, if you want to create a video that simplifies the skill or breaks the skill down even more, then you can send them that way. Kids who are more advanced, you can send them over to the more advanced techniques. It allows a lot of um, flexibility for you to do a lot of the direct instruction and answering of the questions, but not actually having you do that during the class time so that the students can then go get the answers from you still because you're creating those videos, getting those questions answered um, from you, but uh, when they need that answer and not having to wait for you to be free so they can ask you that question. So to be honest, that's kind of like where I'm at, and I kind of want to have some, like if there are questions from people, because it's kind of hard to tell you exactly what it is that that you want to know. So, uh, Jonathan, if you don't mind, I would like to open it up to some questions right now. Um, if anyone does have some. So that's kind of. Hey Matt. Hey Bill. I... Yeah. So we have a question from um, from one of the people who are on the back channel. Uh -huh. the question is, what do I do if my students? will not participate or are not interested in participating? So one of the, one of the things about participation in, in combatives that I found is I kind I want to get their attention. So that's kind of like why I show them the videos of either, uh, in this particular case, uh, capoeira, because that's something that they never heard of before. Um, They've never seen it before. Some, most of them never seen it before. Um, and so I, when I played that video, it, it hooked them in right away. It's like, wait, we're going to be doing that? Um, and the kids who are hooked in right away using this particular format where all the skills are already there for them to be able to reference and look at and see and not actually have to have you there one-on-one -on -one with the student or at a whole group teaching the class, they're able to move on and actually learn. And the kids who are struggling um, whether they don't want to participate or not interested, I can then go and actually invest time with them uh, with being able to help them along. Oftentimes the kids who don't want to participate or not interested are either embarrassed about not having the skills necessary to do the techniques or they're afraid to do the techniques or they might just need some one-on-one -on -one coaching from you. And being able to, because you're doing a blended learning or flipped or both, uh, within the class, the kids really don't have to come and talk to you all that much. Very rarely do I have a student, when I'm doing this particular unit, did I have a student come up to me and say, Mr. Tran, I need uh, this, or I need that, or I don't know how to do this, because I'm always able to direct students to someone or the video where they can get help. So by constantly getting students to check in with me about, oh, well, 
how about, what are you? Are you a one, two, three, or four, right? And I'm using clickers to help so I can actually track who said what. And I can pair people up that way so that, okay, you're just struggling. You still, you still want to do it. You're struggling. Let me put you with someone who's willing to help. Um, with the students who aren't willing to participate, those are the ones that I spend my personal attention uh, and time and effort in the class trying to get them to go. And usually it's just, they just need someone to do it with them that won't make fun of them, and that's, that's who we are. As the teacher, we're not going to be teasing them, uh, teasing them with, with their inability, but instead encouraging them with uh, their ability. Yeah, that's a great... I hope that answered your question. <laughs> that's a great point. Um, and also... Matthew Bissett said that your your enthusiasm really also has yes. has a big effect on your students because you know I've learned when I'm teaching you know if if I show excitement for anything it doesn't matter what it is my kids will respond to what I'm feeling and so so with the videos that's a great one and enthusiasm that's that's another that's another great point. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I haven't done capoeira for that long. I did one class, um, and when I told the kids I was going to do capoeira in class, I actually had one kid who had actually done capoeira in middle school. Huh. And so um, he said, you know how to do capoeira? I go, I know how to do this much capoeira, but I'm still willing to struggle through and learn just like the rest of you. And so when they see me trying to learn the technique right alongside them, they're like, whoa. Mr. Trend's trying to learn too, so if he can learn this way, I can learn this way. And I did this for my dance unit. I I never taught hip hop. I taught hip hop this way. Um, <laughs> I've you know I've done some some line dances that I've never even seen before. I've done this way. So anytime I'm trying, I have to teach something that I don't know how to do. Um, I try to use blended learning as much as possible and leverage that technology because there's someone out there who's already taught it or who's done an instructional video on it. And so just like how we sit and we comb YouTube and we're on the Phys Ed Summit trying to learn the way, new, thing, new ways to do things, that's exactly how the kids learn too. And that, that's what they're used to doing already. So mm -hmm. by doing blended, by doing flipped, you're leveraging things that they already are familiar with doing. So I find it a huge asset for me. And like uh, Matt, uh, he's, a good fr he's a friend of mine, and uh, when he did Tanika Link, he was explaining to me that, oh, hey, you know, I did this video and I was explaining steps and this and that and none of the kids even listened to what the videos were telling them to do. All they did was watch it and said, okay, we're going to go try it. And that's kind of exactly what you need. So that's, the es in essence, how I, I, I teach it. Hmm. So we have a second question from, yeah. from the back channel. Mm -hmm. um, are you required to have students sign waivers to participate? Um, no. Officially, no, because it's part of our standards. It's part of the, the curriculum. So I don't need anything separate in order to do it. Um, I do tell all of my students that we're going to be doing this, and I stress safety a lot. Um, in none of the uh, combatives uh, things that we do, um, do the students actually hit each other or anything like that. It, in with capoeira, it may happen, like accidents happen, you know, in, in any sport though. But for the most part, I've never uh, had anyone seriously hurt doing a combatives class with me. Um, I I stress a lot the safety and not doing beyond what the students is capable of doing. So, for example, combatives is something I do towards the end of the year. So they're already familiar with routine. They're already familiar with how I operate. They're familiar with um, the safety protocols of everything that goes on in class. So it makes it really, 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 really easy to be able to implement this because by then, by the time I'm doing something where, you know, they are hitting, they're, they're in essence, they're fighting. Um, by the time they're doing that, they understand that, you know, we have to respect each other, we have to take care of each other, uh, and a lot of that happens earlier in the year, and you have to set all that up before you can even really do something like this. Definitely. Definitely. Root. Routines and expectations are huge. Yes. So huge. Yes. I see we have another question. Yeah, we have, um, a, yeah, we have a third question. Do you do blended learning for your other instructional sequences? I do blended learning for almost... No, I do... I'm going to rephrase that. I do blended learning for all of my instructional sequences. Um, so in every unit that I do, there's always some element of either video, there's some element of... Um, I do... Uh, do nows and exit tickets, 
every single day, so I can track them. Uh, I use blended or I use uh, clickers whenever I have the kids out in groups and they're learning new skills, and I want to know, okay, where are you at with this particular skill live and and right at that moment, and not wait until the exit ticket. Um, uh, I flip my instruction. I post up videos so for my students uh, in Google Classroom ahead of time, telling them this is what we're going to be learning. Watch this video. It's usually an introductory video, or um, it might be like if we're doing dance, it might be the entire dance, but not the instructional sequence. So they can at least see what's going on. So yeah. So yes, I do do it for every single one. Yeah. Again, if you are following along on, on Tazel, all of the resources that are in this presentation are found right in that Tazel. Um, it's, it's right at the bottom. So if you scroll down, there's a whole boatload of resources that <laughs> can help you implement this fantastic uh, strategy and this fantastic unit into your classroom. And, and folks, if, if you do have questions, um, feel free to ask me. My Twitter handle is PE with Mr. T. My email is PE with Mr. T at Gmail. Uh, I have a Weebly account. It's also PE with Mr. T. Um, that's actually my class website, so you can see some of the things that, that um, I'll be putting up throughout the year. So as I put things up uh, at the beginning of the year and introduce a new unit, that unit becomes live on my, my site and it stays up for the entire year until the beginning of the next year when I uh, close everything down. Um, so feel free to contact me. I, I'm more than happy and willing to help. Uh, my wife might not be happy with it, but you know I, I can do it during my prep time at work too. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I, you know, I had some videos of me actually doing this unit and so you could actually see it, but it's not, it's with, at work, <laughs> so it's not here. It's still on my camera at work, and so um, what I can do is I'll go into the Tazel, and I'll, after I load, upload that video, I'll load it into the Tazel for those of you that uh, want to check it out later and see exactly what it looks like for me. But um, but yeah, I mean, my principal, when she saw this particular lesson, she was like, oh my gosh, you're doing, what is this that you're doing? She's never heard of it, and so the kids actually explained it to her and told her what was going on, so that made me look really great that the students yeah. actually knew what was going on. So. Uh, so if you're looking for a way to to blend or or flip, and combatives isn't your thing, you can do it with any skill: basketball, football, soccer. All you have to do is find uh, find a way for you to either create the video or find the video on YouTube. Do they do? I see we have another question. Yeah, our next question is. So with your exit tickets, do yeah. the students complete the exit ticket at the end of class, or do you have them do it do it um, at home? Because um, one of our viewers noticed that you have them do it do it via either a computer or an iPad. Yeah. So the school I work at, we're a one to one device school, and so last year every student had an iPad, um, uh, and so when I gave them the digital agenda for the day or things like that, it, the last item would always be the exit ticket. And um, at our school, we don't have locker rooms. We're a charter school. And so the kids, they change um, in the boys' or girls' bathroom, depending. And so the way I set it up was you would first do the exit ticket and then go change. So as soon as they were, or you would go change and then come and do the exit ticket. So I they would always have their device with them, and so it didn't matter um, when they did it, per se, but they would have to have it done before the next school day, so that or the next time we met, we're also on block schedule, so we see every other day. Mm -hmm. um, and so they would have to have that in for me. And then because I do it on Google Form, I would just go in and I could sort by period, I could sort by comments, and so on and so forth, and, and look at what the students were saying and doing and whatnot, and, I, and sometimes I would actually take what one period said and adjust it for the next the next period. And so um, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't work because some periods are more advanced, other periods are lower, so on and so forth. But yes, I had them do it uh, in class before they left every day. And in terms of a do, I, the do now activity would always be again in class. They would go change. I give them only five minutes to change, so 
they change, they come into my room, the first thing they do is they open up their digital agenda, go to the do now, and start answering the questions in the do now. Excellent. Yeah, and what you were talking about with with you being able to see their responses in real time and then based on their responses you adjust you know your teaching for the next next class like that that to me is a perfect example of you know your evidence based teaching and you know yeah yeah and you know, not just you know going by a planned teaching class teaching teaching class but actually you know, using the feedback that your students give you you know by your answers and using that to drive your instruction which I which I think is really huge yeah it, it, it's it's super important to be able to get that feedback from them live um, when flickers came out at first I was like wait I this is huh how am I gonna do this and once I started instituting it and and you know listening to Kevin Tiller and some of the other people um, out there on Twitter this Twitter sphere and 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 boxer they they opened my eyes to it and once I started using it I, I couldn't put it down it was like wait why, why, why haven't I been doing this before um, this particular year we have um, class sets of iPads so the iPads that I have now I assign it to a particular student so what I'm thinking about doing now is I'm going to take all of my clickers and either tape them onto the back of the iPad so now the students will always have that same clicker card. I don't have to distribute it separately from the iPad. It's right there with them all the time now. And so yeah, that's gonna be a that's gonna be great. You know, they'll just be able to turn their iPad whichever way and, and be able to tell me what answer that they have. And so it's gonna be a lot easier for me this year, I think. Yeah. Hopefully. That's yeah, a really good system. Yeah. Um let's see. I, I see in the back channel that uh, some Erica said that she's never used exit tickets. Um, and how benefit? How much benefit can they be? They're they're a huge benefit if you want to actually know what your students are thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, sometimes there there are those days, and all of us have had them before, where we we have this awesome lesson planned. We go in, we execute it. We think yes, we got it. And then the following day, you try to bring up the same topic again, and all the kids are looking at you like, what? What are you talking about? And so an exit ticket, it really lets you be able to gauge whether or not they actually learned what they learned. Because we sometimes, as physical educators, we think, oh, well, they're doing the movements, therefore they've learned the move. And that's not always the case. They are doing the movement because they're mimicking either what they saw, what, what you did, or what someone else is doing. And uh, it just looks that way to, to us from the outside observer. But in their head, they really haven't grasped the concept yet. So exit tickets. Um, using clickers to, to check real quick. Um, I use Kahoot. I, I leverage so much technology in my class. The, the teachers last year basically all told me you use more technology than I do. And I'm English, I'm math, science, so on and so forth. And I'm like, well, I love tech. And if it allows me to reach my kids and be able to understand what they're thinking and how they're thinking and what they're learning, I'm going to use it because I want to make sure that I'm teaching them at that moment what they need, not tomorrow what they forgot, what they needed. You know, it, 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 it allows me to use my time more wisely in the classroom. Yeah, definitely. Now, so, yeah. um, so, how, so how long are your class periods? So we have a, every, every week we have two block days that are, this year they're two hours long. Last year they were about an hour and 45 minutes long. So we were able to pull some more minutes out of the, the school day because we got rid of um, some some management things that and transitional things that we didn't need anymore. And so we were able to take those minutes and move them into the classroom, which is great. Um, but my lessons that all I planned last year now are all too short. So I'm finding that I have to go back and adjust and, and do things. You can't just let them practice more people. It doesn't work like that because they will get bored. <laughs> yeah. um, and then on Wednesdays um, are our short days. We have them for about 50 minutes on Wednesday, um, and we see all of our periods on that day. So that's our PD days and things like that. So yeah, it's it's a long period of time to be constantly moving, and so that's why I have to build in these checks for understanding because um, if it was a 45-minute class or or and or something like that, um, 
or you know, after changing time and everything in the high school, you know, it'd be like a 35, 40 minute class after you take enroll and everything. Mm -hmm. um, it, it it goes by real quick, and so you're used to that fast pace. Whereas with the block period, I have tons of time. You know, in a two hour block, I'm gonna have my kids for a total taking out all the transition time for an hour and 50 minutes. Um, because, you know, they get the five minutes to dress, but while they're dressing, I'm, I'm already in, engaging them in either a video or some writing or reading or something else. So I'm constantly engaging them from the moment they step into my room to the moment they leave my room, which they hate me for it, but, you know, they love me at the end of the year, and that's what I care about. I don't care what you think about me right now. Exactly. Oh, I see, Matt. Yeah, tech, Matt, you're totally right. Tech is not uh, a diversion if you leverage the use of tech properly. That's what it all comes down to. You have to leverage the technology um, properly. If you allow them to be able to you know, move off and, and go off somewhere else, uh, then that's not going to work. Um, in terms of, like, I know some people say, well, we're not a one-to-one -one school or we're not a gay school and things like that. Uh, you can do the same thing with fewer fewer devices. All you do now, instead of having each student independently learn, you create stations and put the device at the station. So now, as the student is done with one station, have them move to another station, and they can use that device to then, again, watch the video, replay the video, see what it is they're supposed to do, and then move on and go. And then you can have uh, uh, printouts of written instructions instead of using the device for the written instruction. So there's, there's always ways um, of doing it. Uh, you can also do uh, QR codes. So if you have all the written instructions on a piece of paper like I did on, on the Google Doc, you then put a QR code next to it. So at the station, they take their paper and it's like, OK, I, I need this one. And they'll scan that QR code so that they can get to that particular video on that device. So there's ways around it. You don't, you don't ha necessarily have to have one-to-one -one device in order to make this work. I've done it with, uh, like right now, I don't have uh, enough devices for all of my kids because we just have a lot of kids this year. I have about 10 to 15 more than I did last year in my largest class. So um, they're sharing the devices and they're using you know my devices and things like that. And so we're, we're making it work. And you just got to be creative. Be flexible, be creative. That's, yeah. that's how we think as PE teachers. That's true. Very yeah. True. So. Trying to see if there's anything else maybe going on in the back channel. Well, there. Well, this. <laughs> do you have any um, examples of the exit tickets? I know that uh, you you showed one um, earlier yes. in your session. Let me let me let me show you. Let me pull up another one that I have. Cause I have a bunch. So here's, here are some exit tickets um, that I have. Let's, let's go away. Uh, that's not what I wanted. My name. What's going on here? So here's, this was probably, I think, my first one. Oh, no. This was my template one. So here's my exit ticket. Come on, go. From again the combatives unit. This is the back end. This is what it looks. Ah, I forget. I'm not on my my school account. So, so here we go. Here's one. Um, this was right after I introduced Krav Maga. So I was asking the students, what does Krav Maga mean? And it was real basic, real simple. And then um, why would you stomp on a head instead of kicking it like a soccer ball? So we went over this in class. And then the students would then 
I did a, a doc appender, so this all went into their com combatives notes. So these were all my students. So they would choose their name, submit it, and then it would go into their notes straight away uh, with the questions already attached in there. Um, that's one example. Uh, let's see. Here's another one. Ah, see what happens when I don't turn off the permissions for this. <laughs> so here's another one. This was, what was this? This was a session on where we were talking about negative attitudes towards physical activity in general. So, uh, you know, what are some examples of negative attitudes that people have? Um, how, and then how can we turn them into positives? Um, what are some reasons why people enjoy doing physical activities? How can you help others uh, have a positive attitude? So I would just ask these questions, and on the back end, I would always get their answers and uh, responses would look something like this for me. And so now I can actually go, oops, I can go and see a particular student, what period I had them, and I can look and take a look at a movement. So this particular question was, uh, explain which movement was easiest for you to perform today. And the students wrote in this particular box that the Jenga, because you move in the same place uh, longest if you have it, if you have to around it will be hard, but then I'm going to get confused what I'm doing. So doing, doing this um, allows me to get a general idea. Like I'm looking at content. I don't want to look at specifics and their language and this and that. That's what the English teacher does. So I'm looking at content. So it's, they're telling me that the Jenga, because it's a, lot, it's a simple movement for them, and you just repeat the same thing over and over again. Whereas uh, this particular same, same student wrote that it's, the difficult was the hole, uh, because they have to go back to the Jenga right afterwards. And so that, for them, was a confusing piece. And so knowing this, I can now go in and say, oh, following day, I'm going to show the transition between that, those two particular skills. Um, and allows them, it gives me great opportunity to be able to see how, how they're, uh, how they need, how they're trying, their learning and where they're struggling so that I can address those particular needs. And the things that are easy, I can go quick over it, just quick review, say, okay, the Jenga, remember, it goes like this, and then move on. So I don't have to spend time teaching something that they're already used to. How's that for exit tickets? Would that work? That's excellent. Yes. All right. Those are those are great resources. Yeah, I mean, the exit tickets can be anything you want. You don't have to make it complex. Um, I've seen some teachers uh, do it on paper. Um, I don't like paper because that means I have to carry it around. Uh, you know, I, I use multiple spaces at my school because we are a charter school. So I'm going from my classroom to the multi-purpose room to outside and back. I don't want to have to lug around the papers to hand out to them and then get it back. It's a lot easier if I just use the digital formats uh, because then no papers, I don't lose anything because, you know, you drop something, it's gone and, and it's bad for the kids because you're, we all will tell them, no, you didn't turn anything in when they did turn something in and so now we're making, we're basically accusing them of being liars when they're not. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely leverage the technology. Without a doubt. Uh, you have any uh, final thoughts on, on your presentation? Um, I think it was a lot shorter. I mean, it's it's not blended learning is is a simple simple thing to do, but it's a time consuming thing to do. And so I would suggest to all of you out there who are watching and and whatnot to take a moment, choose one particular thing that you want to do, and then just go with that first. Get comfortable with that particular element, and then move on. So maybe it's just going to be taking the video, linking the video to the document so that the students can then click on the link to go to that particular video. You know, start there. And then as you get more comfortable, you can start making it more individualized. You can throw the video in like a Google form and so the students can then pick from a drop down menu or something. And the more you do, um, the more the more you spend time to work at it, the more you're gonna get better at it and the more you're gonna want to learn. That's how it happened to me. Like I said, I've only been doing blended learning for um, one school year. 
and I only learned about it the summer before the school year started. And so uh, I've taught myself a lot. Um, I've gone online to Twitter and found a lot of people who had tons of resources and watched their videos and don't feel that just because uh, it's not a PE video, um, you can't use it. You can totally use it. Steal it, learn from it, and then figure out how you're going to apply it to your PE class because that's going to be the best way that you're going to be able to leverage uh, blended learning and flipped instruction. Definitely. Well, I would just right. like to say thank you to David Tran from California for, for joining us and teaching us about teaching combatives with blended learning and flipping. Um, David, if you want to stick around on Tazel, um, if anyone has, has any questions, yeah. David will be there to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for joining us, and we still have a long way to go in the Phys Ed Summit, so oh hang in there. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hang in there and continue learning. All right, have a good one, everybody. Thank you, have a good one.